Lowriding is something that is a part of who you are and what you do. What makes you a lowrider is your ability to overcome challenges and obstacles, not only on your car, but in your life. The coolest thing about having a convertible is probably the open feeling that you have. You don't feel constricted with the open air around you. It's beautiful in the daytime. It's beautiful in the nighttime. Being underneath the stars, the music's going. You know, I like to cruise to some oldies when I'm cruising in my car. It's almost undescribable, but if I had to describe it, I would describe it as being on an amusement ride that's just slow and steady for a long time. The car that I currently own is a 1960 Chevy Impala convertible. She's a stock car. Wheels, interior, top. She's just a cruiser. The 1960 Impala is the Chevy Sunburst Red is the color. It's got a black convertible top, black and white interior, red dashboard, red carpets. So it's a nice mix of red and black. The power plant has been transplanted out. It's a 350 motor, 350 transmission, with overdrive. It's got a 283 intake, two-barrel carburetor. So it's set up to look like a stock car, but a couple upgrades to make it run well on the freeway. The wheels are stock, just some Copa radios on there, stock hubcaps. There's a Continental kit on the back with another spare tire in the back. Same 14-inch rims that came with it from the factory. Factory rims, factory hubcaps. The tires were made to look uh, factory, but uh, they are Coker reproductions. I've had this 1960 since about two and a half years ago. It was a birthday present that I got to myself when I turned 40 years old. I've always loved 1960 Impalas. I was actually looking for a 1962 Impala and I reached out to a gentleman uh, on Craigslist in Massachusetts. He didn't want to go as low as I was offering and I didn't want to go as high as he was asking, so he mentioned he had another car that I may be interested in, which was a 60 Impala. And he was real candid about what the car needed and I bought it. When I got it back home, we uh, started working on it. We put the uh, carpet in, and put the interior in, the door panels, the seats, the uh, convertible top. I ended up putting a Continental kit on it. I put some skirts on it. You know, she's a cruiser, so we start her up on Sundays, take her out for cruises, we ride, and we have a good time. Over the years, I've probably had about 10 to 15 different lowriders. Some of the ones that stand out the most was my first, my Buick Regal. That was the first car I've ever lifted, and after that I had a 64 Impala. And over the years, I've had Cadillacs. I'm real fond of Cadillacs. Uh, I've got one now. I've got a 96 Cadillac Fleetwood that I've been building. You know, we just keep it going. As the time goes by, you know, cars, they come and they go. And some stay and some don't. I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, up until I was about, about 14 or 15 years old. My family was a working class family. My dad worked for Chrysler for 30 years. He worked on the assembly line. My mom, she was an insurance adjuster for, for quite some time. I think at 40 years old, she went back to school and got her master's degree in social work. I have two sisters. I've got an older sister, Rochelle. I've got a younger sister, Rosalind. I guess, you know, we were a typical family. I mean, we definitely had our challenges growing up, but one thing we did share and enjoy was each other. Detroit was not without its challenges, and I think my parents realized that earlier on, and they ended up moving us from Detroit to the suburbs out in Milan, Michigan. My parents really wanted to take us out of that environment because it had its toxicity. I mean, it was parts of it that just wasn't good for a young black man growing up. I think they wanted to at least give us the opportunity to see other sides of the world, and I'm grateful that they did that. The toxicity of growing up in Detroit, it could be described as a culture of deviant behavior that was normalized. You know, it was normal to do things that were illegal, to be honest with you, and, you know, it was easy to grow up thinking that these things were okay. As I mentioned earlier, that carried on with me when I moved to a small town, you know, whereas I thought it was okay to, you know, fight and steal a bike and be, a, you know, a rambunctious young man. When you move to an area that's zero tolerance, you, you end up paying the price for it. And at an early age, probably about 16, I think was the first time I got arrested. Um, I got arrested for stealing a bike, charged and convicted as an adult.
This is where the prison to pipeline uh, term comes from. When you are charged and convicted of an adult crime at a young age, that sets you up to be able to uh, get harsher convictions if you commit another crime later on down your life and eventually you know, puts you on that track to prison. And I think had it not been for the intervention of my, my mother, who was instrumental in trying to keep me on the right track, um, that undoubtedly would, be, would have been you know, my narrative. And I think that had I stayed on that path uh, for much longer, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. As a result of the constant trouble that I got in as a teenager, I didn't graduate from high school. Thankfully for the foresight of my mother, who registered me in community college. My mom has always been an instrumental person in my life. She has always been a role model to me. My mom was 40 years old when she decided to go back to school. And at the time, I don't think that I appreciated the amount of work and effort that went into that. She worked all day and she still had a family that she had to raise and kids she needed to take care of and a household she needed to manage and still managed to go back to school and, and get a, a master's degree, University of Michigan. I didn't know it at the time, but I'm sure that seeing that, you know, probably set in motion something in me that said, you can do it too. And seeing the fulfillment that my mother got from going back to school at 40 years old certainly laid the groundwork for me to be able to do so at, at 32 years old. Eventually, the credits that I got from community college qualified me to get my high school diploma. In doing so, I got an associate's degree from community college. Uh, by the time I graduated, my son's mom was pregnant with my twin boys. So I graduated community college and I was a new father. From there on, I started working immediately. It was then I got a job as a telecommunications contractor installing uh, high-speed internet lines. The cell phone was just emerging or at least becoming more popular. So I knew that at some particular point, people aren't going to be having landlines anymore. So I always knew that I wanted to do something else. Again, when I was you know, 16 years old and I was getting in trouble and going to court, one thing that I noticed while I was in court was that people who were represented by attorneys seemed to fare just a little bit better than the folks who weren't. And I thought to myself, I'd like to become a lawyer one day. So I decided to go back to school and finish my bachelor's degree and I went on to law school. I worked during the day, I went to law school at night, and I did that for about three and a half, four years, until eventually I was able to graduate law school. It wasn't until I was 37 years old that I graduated law school. However, to become an attorney, not only must you pass the bar exam, you must pass what's called character and fitness, which means that you must possess the, the requisite moral character and fitness to practice law. And having a criminal record doesn't necessarily comport well with that. So I had to go through a couple years of reconciling the things that I've done in the past in order to prove to the state bar that I wasn't the same person that I was growing up, that I was capable of making better decisions than I did when I was a kid. So I ended up getting my bar license a couple years later, and now I am both an attorney, I'm a law professor. I teach technology law at the law school. I also teach some other courses on academic uh, skills, academic success, uh, bar pass classes. I do practice as well, I have my own practice. My practice is focused towards technology-related law and criminal law. I focus on criminal law because I promised myself a long time ago that I wanted to you know, give back to the folks who are in my community and by being able to help them with the area of law that they're unfortunately most likely to come in contact with is my way of being able to you know, help out and give back for the blessing that I had. So I've been in the Majestic Car Club probably for about 12 years now. You know, we've grown over the years. Now we're up to about 30 some odd chapters. Uh, we're all over the world. You know, we've got chapters in Japan, we've got chapters in Paris, uh, in Europe, we've got chapters in Toronto, in Canada. And we're literally all over the country. All of us share that, that brotherhood, that family. The Majestics has been a great experience. It's something that I'll probably be with for the rest of my life, to be honest with you. It's that much of a brotherhood, it's that much of a family. We try to do a lot in the community. Actually, every year, you know, we hold a toy drive, you know, we raise funds for organizations. We just do it for the community. And to have the support of a worldwide organization with, you know, massive amounts of resources, you know, is comforting. 
And that's something that I enjoy and I'm, I'm really, really glad I'm a part of. As a relatively young black man, when most often people don't see me as an attorney, as a law professor. I don't necessarily fit the picture that you know they may have formed in their mind. Only 2% of lawyers in the United States are black men, and I'm proud to be a part of that 2%. The reaction folks tend to give and find out that I'm into low riding and I'm an attorney, I'm a law professor, they love it, they think it's super cool. One thing I do when I teach my classes is on the first day when I introduce myself, I say, hey, my name is Ryan Johnson and I'm a lowrider. People think that I'm you know, a lot more cooler than I actually am because of the cool car that I have. And to be honest with you, I'm happy to be able to show them a different side of it. The message that I would share to young folks that are up and coming right now, you are capable of pretty much anything you set your mind to. I realize that sounds as cliche as possible, that you can do anything you set your mind to, but I swear that it's true. The saying generally is, I'll see it when I believe it, but when it comes to fulfilling your dreams or your destiny, you have to believe it before you can see it, and the rest will fall into place. You just need to make the decision, you need to be dedicated, and you need to um, apply the requisite amount of discipline in order to fulfill that. The time is gonna go by anyway. Um, you might as well work towards an end game or a goal that you set forth and it'll, you'll achieve it. Just keep working at it, keep working at it. And that's exactly what I did and at the end of the day it paid off. You are never too old to follow your dreams or your passions. It's never too late. The only thing that needs to change in is your mind. You need to decide that this is what you want to do and you just need to make it happen. My name is Ryan Johnson. I'm an attorney, I'm a law professor, and a lowrider role model.